Hello and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutor Star Course Series, where I think we've all heard the phrase that the pen is mightier than the sword. And today we're going to investigate a little bit of where that came from and why by looking at propaganda through World War I, how the messaging war was won here on the home front. And to do that, we've got the perfect teacher for you too. We've got Ashley Anderson here from the Maryland Center for History and Culture here to take us through the propaganda messaging of World War I uh, in a great program we've got here. A couple things for you. It's all about messaging and it is here too. You'll see there's a chat box to the right of the screen. We want you to answer the questions Ashley asked you and ask her questions of your own. So whenever she asks a question, use that chat box to answer and ask any questions you have throughout today's program. In the last 10 minutes or so, I'll interview Ashley with your questions to get you some answers. Obviously, nowadays, messaging includes social media, and so we've got a little bit of a contest as well. In about 30 minutes, we'll give everybody a chance to lean into the screen, take a selfie with some of the stars of today's show in terms of propaganda posters. If you upload that to Instagram, tag the Maryland Center and Varsity Tutors, you'll be entered to win a spot in an after-school club with Varsity Tutors this year. So make sure you're ready to message it through class and after class. But with that said, let me turn it over to today's messenger, your teacher, Ashley from the Maryland Center for History and Culture. All right. Thank you, Brian. So again, my name's Ashley. I am visiting you from the Maryland Center for History and Culture. I'm a historian at a great big museum located in downtown Baltimore. So if you all are ever in the area, um, we would love to see you. But the best part about my job is the fact that I get to connect in to classes and to teach and uh, to talk about some significant moments in history. And so today we are going to be examining propaganda in the home front of World War I. So we're going to start off first by uh, defining some terms, which include the difference between advertising and propaganda. So advertising is meant to draw attention to a product, service, or event in a public medium in order to promote sales or attendance. So I want you to think about your lives, present day 2021, and put in the chat box, what are some examples of advertisements? So give me some examples. Maybe where do you see advertisements? Um, where do you interact with advertisements? So I see one of the main ones we think of are commercials on TV, people trying to get you to buy a particular product or um, think a particular product is really cool, kind of get it into your brain. But where else do we see advertisements? Yep, on um, billboards as well. So we're driving down the road and we'll see on those billboards um, different products for wherever you're driving to or driving towards. Nice job. Yeah, and we see a lot of advertising on social media, whether you're like scrolling through Instagram or I know there's a whole like sub TikTok that says TikTok made me buy it. That's a form of advertisement where you're like, oh, I saw this cool thing on social media. I ought to give it a try. So it's getting you, or it's taking your attention to products or services. Um, we also see it on social media with like influencers, for example. My favorite example is like Kylie Jenner and her makeup line um, because she is constantly promoting it and saying how great it is. So that is also a form of advertisement. Now we're gonna compare that to propaganda. So propaganda is biased information that's meant to shape public opinion and behavior. So instead of getting you to buy something, um, it is trying to get you to like change your mind about something. And we've all seen propaganda before. Um, it might take a minute to think of it, but put in the chat an example of propaganda. So we've talked about advertisements, but what is like biased information help to shape public opinion and behavior? Yeah, I see the big one coming through is um, like political advertisements, especially around election years or uh, even during like local elections, you'll see maybe these commercials on TV or radio advertisements, you'll hear those saying vote for me because this is why I'm the best or don't vote for this person because this is all the stuff that they did that we don't agree with. So we see that um, way to try and change our minds. I'm like, okay, who should we vote for? So that's, that's a pretty big um, like the first thing that comes to mind when we think of like propaganda in the present day. So we're gonna also talk about World War I as well. So I want you to put um, any fun World War facts you already know in the chat. 
So think about what was going on politically or economically or socially. I'll give you a chance to put some of those ideas in the chat. Nice job. Yeah, I'm seeing World War I took place over 100 years ago. Nice job. Yeah, and it started with an assassination of Archduke uh, Franz Ferdinand. Nice job. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of like political unrest in uh, Europe at this time. Wonderful. So we'll catch us up here on some fun facts. So World War I did begin June 28th, 1914 with the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. And then we see um, the two sides kind of split. So the central powers include Germany, Austria, Hungary, Bulgaria, and the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire is like an offshoot of the Roman Empire. Uh, fun fact for you. And then the Triple Entente included the United Kingdom, France, and the Russian Empire. So in, uh, Germany attacks France in August 1914. And then because uh, France and the UK were allies, that brought the UK into the war. And under Woodrow Wilson, the United States tried to stay neutral. Um, initially, the US did not want anything to do with World War I. And uh, both sides really, really, really sought to bring the United States into the war. And they wanted um, the US to support either side. So why do you think people were vying for the United States to join their side? Why would they want the United States to join their side? Yeah, first of all, we've got a lot of like natural resources here. So we can maybe provide like food or um, lumber. Excellent. Yeah, we're also a major, major like political power. And so that would maybe sway. We could also provide, yes, the manpower. They wanted the people, they wanted soldiers to uh, join either side. But again, under Wilson, he tried to stay as neutral as possible. Now we know eventually the United States would join uh, the First World War. And in order to learn more about what was going on here in the United States, we're gonna take a look at some primary sources. So I want, us to, uh, I want you all to tell me in the chat, what is a primary source? So I'll start us off. This is something that historians use every single day to learn more about the past. So what is a primary source? Yeah, like an artifact, that's a really great example of a primary source. Nice job. Yeah, sources can include books or letters. Excellent. Oh, there it is. Yes, it is a firsthand account from the past. So someone said it was like the main source. So it is a firsthand account from the past, meaning someone lived a long time ago they saw something or they experienced something and then they documented it in some way. So we're gonna just go through a few examples of primary sources just to kind of warm up our brains. And in order to do this, we are all going to be historians. So like I said, I'm visiting you from a museum. I'm a historian. I went to school for many years to study history. So um, as historians, we're kind of like detectives as, of the past because as much as we would love to be able to time travel, Unfortunately, we can't do that. So instead, we have to look at the stuff that people left behind. So one of these things here, we're gonna take a look at this document and we're going to first identify what this is. And then we're gonna talk about how we know it is a firsthand account from the past. So when you think you have it, type in the chat, what kind of document is this? And again, I should mention, this is just transcribed. Uh, so this is a lot easier for us to read, but this is the same. All right, yeah, I see it coming through. It's, it's a journal or someone's diary. Nice job. So that's step one. We have now identified what this is. Step two is how do we know this is from the past? What are some clues that tell us this is from the past? Right, I'm seeing it come through. Yeah, the date. The date is always going to be that giveaway. So this letter, or sorry, this diary rather, 
uh, was written in 1881. Now, it also might be a giveaway that the paper is kind of yellowed, the handwriting looks old fashioned, but the date will always tell us exactly how old something is. So how do we know now that a diary is a firsthand account? So kind of think about like English and language arts and points of view. Yeah, I see it coming through. Yeah, it's written in the first person or I see a bunch of just like eyes in there. The eyes have it, it's written in the first person. So January 5th says, I stayed home from school this morning so mama could go out. They're talking about what they were doing on that day in 1881. So as historians, we love to look at old letter or old diaries and journals. We also like to read old letters. So obviously this is a letter because it starts off dear, in this case, John. We know it is from the past because it was written the 30th of July, 1812. But instead of using words like I, in this letter, they're using your and you because they are writing to somebody else. So we're gonna take a look at another example of a primary source. So I'm gonna scooch out of the way here and someone tell me what is going on in this picture? Yeah, it's like a, a parade or a protest. You're on the right track. Yeah, nice job. This is showing the women's uh, suffrage movement and women are marching in this case for the right to vote. So again, let's think about how do we know that this is from the past? So tell me in the chat, how do we know that this photo is from the past? Yeah, nice job. It's in black and white. That's usually a giveaway. Although we still sometimes take black and white photos today. Yeah, the way they're dressed too is very different than what we wear today. Yeah, and someone got it. Yeah, women can vote today. Women have had the right to vote for over 100 years, um, actually 101 years to be exact. And uh, 100 years ago or so, women were not able to vote. So we know this photo is from the past. Also, just a fun fact, this photo was uh, probably taken around the same time that the United States was getting involved in World War I. So that's also kind of something to remember when we're talking about history. There are multiple events happening within this like same era, the same time frame, even though typically we just talk about World War I and we just talk about the suffrage movement and we don't usually like mishmash the two, even though both of those events were happening around the same time. So the suffrage movement was very much in full swing during World War I. But uh, let's get back to this as a primary source as an example. How do we know that a photo is a firsthand account? Yeah, it's a firsthand account because if you're gonna take a picture of something, you actually have to be there. So you're there firsthand, in this case, someone was there watching women march for the right to vote and they snapped that photo in that moment. So now sometimes artwork can be considered a primary source. So this is a painting of Baltimore City. Um, we know Baltimore does not look like this today. So it's definitely from the past. But if you're the artist and you're gonna paint a cityscape, what, were, what are you going to have to do if you're gonna get all of that detail onto your canvas? Yeah, you have to look at it. Nice job. Uh, maybe you could look at like a picture or something of it, but there it is. Better yet, you have to be there. So that's what this artist did. They sat on this hill, looked down into the city and they painted exactly what they were looking at. Now with artwork, we have to be a little bit careful um, because we know art can also come from people's imaginations. So for example, if someone drew or painted rather a dragon flying in the sky, is that still considered a primary source? Just put a quick yes or no in the chat. See a few rogue yeses, but yeah, I'm seeing lots and lots of no's. If there's a dragon flying in the sky of this painting, then it is fictional, it's pretend, uh, because we know dragons don't really exist. And then finally, uh, artifacts and objects are really great examples of primary sources. 
So just for fun, I want us to take a guess what this object behind me is. I'm going to start us off with a hint. All three of these pieces work together. So you're trying to figure out what they all are working together. Give it a second, see some guesses come through. Ooh, someone guessed, is it for stamps? It is not for stamps, but that's a good guess. Hmm. It's not for like shining shoes either. That's a good one. Oh, I'm seeing makeup come through quite a bit. You're on the right track, but it is not makeup. Yeah, someone got it. This is an old shaving kit. Nice job. So this is soap in a box. This is a brush and this is a mirror. So whoever used this would lather up the soap put the soap on their face using the brush and then they would use the mirror so they could see what they were doing. So the only thing not pictured would be like the razor that somebody would use to shave their face. Nice job. So now that we've gone through a few of these examples of uh, primary sources, we're gonna take a look at some actual primary sources regarding World War I and the home front. So specifically, we're gonna take a look at this poster here. Um, I want to, you all to just take a minute Take it all in, and I want you to think kind of about the who, the what, the where, the when, and the why. And again, since this is a propaganda poster, it's trying to get you to maybe change your mind about something or to kind of like lean into a particular idea. So what is this poster trying to get you to do? You as the viewer, what is it trying to get you to do? Yeah, well done. It's trying to get you to buy government bonds. Or it's also trying to get you to remember the flag of liberty and to support it. Excellent. So these bonds were a way to help um, fund the war. This was a way to help ensure that eventually when the United States did get involved, um, the U.S. troops were as well taken care of as possible. So these bonds were a way to help um, fund that. So we now know what it's trying to get you to do, trying to buy a government bonds. Now let's talk about what do we notice about the people in this poster? What stands out to you about the people? All right, so this guy in the front, he has kind of a serious expression. They all might maybe look serious. Good observation. Yeah, you see he's like holding his like hat over his heart or his chest. Nice job. Yeah, there's like a man, a woman, and a child. So maybe they're a family. That's a good observation. And finally, we're seeing they're standing and the flag is waving in the background. And this might be hard to see, um, but this is a ship. So... During this era as well, there was a lot of immigration happening over to uh, the United States, especially from European countries. So maybe this is implying that these people are immigrants. Uh, maybe this is a way to show that they are supporting the flag in the United States. And so they're going to buy like war bonds. I also think it's worth noting too that uh, the people look kind of realistic. Like they're not too cartoony or their features aren't over-exaggerated. They look pretty well like people. And so it's looking at maybe just your quintessential, like your idea of an American and what they look like and what they should stand for. So I want you to tell me in the chat, do you think this is a form of positive propaganda or negative propaganda? And tell me why you think that. Seeing lots of positives. Yeah, someone says it's positive because people are maybe supporting the flag, celebrating it, supporting the United States. Yeah, it's, it's playing on people's emotions. So somebody's like, uh, they said something along the lines of, um, it's, it's happy, or it seems maybe like patriotic. Yeah, so it's playing on like, oh, if you're, 
patriotic to the United States. You should buy some government bonds. Good observation. So yeah, this is this is a form of like more positive type of propaganda for people to buy these war bonds. So here we have like a pharmacy storefront. Uh, this would be the equivalent of like our, you know, CVSs and Walgreens. I know my local CVS did not look like this. Um, so we can see even pharmacies were putting up, uh, and storefronts were putting up forms of propaganda to get people to buy war bonds. So we have a woman here, it's maybe hard to see, holding a little baby with maybe a small dog or some kind of critter there. And it says, it's hard to read, but it says, buy war bonds. Um, this one, this is of uh, soldiers in a plane. And it says, again, really hard to read, but it says, keep him flying, buy war bonds. So again, this is a way to encourage people on the home front and typically people on the home front included women who were um, maybe holding down the fort, taking care of the families. Uh, some women did start to get involved um, in the workforce during World War I. Of course, we would see that um, even more during the Second World War. But this is a time where women uh, were holding down the house and maybe for the first time getting jobs and buying war bonds would, um, they're appealing to women who are on the home front to buy those war bonds. So we're gonna watch now, or before that, um, this is what a war bond looked like. But now we're gonna watch a quick, it's a silent film. So there's of course no sound. Uh, but we're going to watch this silent film, and I want you to pay attention again to kind of the who, the what, the where, the when, and the why. So we can see that was, actually, I want you to tell me in the chat, who was there uh, leading that speech? Let's see if anyone caught that. It was at the very, very beginning. Who was leading that speech? Nice job. Yeah, it was TR, also known as Teddy Roosevelt. So uh, former president. So he is at uh, Camden Yards in Baltimore encouraging people to buy war bonds. So I like to point out, um, I believe the video said this was in 1918, so nearing the end of the war. Um, but in 1918, we also know that there was a flu-like pandemic going around at this time. So I think it's really interesting now that we've all kind of lived through and experienced a pandemic ourselves, like seeing this crowd of people shoulder to shoulder, it's like, ooh, I don't know if that would fly for us in 2021. But we can see he's like rallying the crowd to buy war bonds. Do we think that this method of um, encouraging people to buy war bonds, was this effective? Tell me yes or no and why you think that. I see quite a few yeses are coming through. Someone said yes, because it's a former president. So maybe people, um, were encouraged by the former president. They were maybe inspired by him. Other people also saying yes, because you can see there's a huge crowd here and people seem to be clapping and cheering. So this was another way to get people to buy these war bonds. So we're gonna take a look. Um, so the US did not get involved in uh, the first world war until 1917. And we can see the amount of bonds that were purchased and that increase in like the shares and uh, just how many billions uh, were raised when, uh, oh my gosh, I just lost my train of thought. Oh, when buying war bonds. So these are the results of the Liberty Loan campaigns. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about what was going on um, 
specifically in Maryland, since that's where I'm visiting you from. However, uh, this is applicable to other states all over the country during the First World War. So because Maryland is a coastal state, uh, we here in Maryland were concerned about attacks from German U-boats. Uh, so we activated the Oyster Navy to patrol these U-boats in the Chesapeake Bay. So the Oyster Navy was initially started to make sure people were, um, they weren't poaching the oysters out of the bay. They had to have a license and they had to make sure that uh, they were fishing in the correct areas of water. They weren't crossing over any like state lines like into Virginia. So that's originally why the Oyster Navy was created, but it also helped patrol the waters uh, from German U-boats. And then uh, people were preparing for war and tanks started traveling up and down Baltimore and Washington. And uh, this turned into a way to like protect not only Baltimore, but if you get into Maryland, um, Washington DC is only like 40 minutes down the road from Baltimore. So Maryland's a fairly small state. So if an enemy were to land on these shores and get through Maryland, they would have a straight shot into Washington DC. So they started uh, making sure that that would not be possible in case um, Germans were to land here. And then as we can see, uh, we're starting to see, it's called Camp Meade, but that would eventually turn into Fort Meade. Uh, this would be an army base. Uh, and now it's also um, where it, like the NSA is today. So we have Camp Meade that would eventually be Fort Meade. So we see um, that becoming more and more of a popular military base at this time. And then we can see Fort McHenry was also involved. So Fort McHenry is best known for the bombardment of Fort McHenry in the War of 1812, but we can see it also played a role during World War I. This is also a really interesting uh, propaganda poster for the Red Cross, calling the Red Cross the greatest mother in the world. So uh, I think that's kind of interesting. This was a way to also appeal to people to join with the Red Cross to help um, supply the Red Cross in any way or be part of it. So thousands of people uh, joined up with the Red Cross as both employees and as volunteers during the First World War. And then again, in May of 1917, Maryland men of fighting age began to register for the draft. And then uh, the federal government activated the Maryland National Guard and created the 313th Infantry that trained again at Camp Meade, eventually Fort Meade. And then in August of 1917, the Maryland National Guard left for final training in Alabama, and then uh, they would be eventually reshuffled and uh, go across the seas to fight during the First World War. So here we have an image of some recruits here. And then finally, um, again, we're seeing Fort McHenry, which again is, is mostly thought of when we think of uh, the War of 1812 here in Maryland, but again, it also played a role as a general hospital. Uh, so the hospital was co constructed around the old Star Fort, and then uh, this, this facility saw 20,000 wounded and six soldiers, and uh, some people would pass through for a little bit of treatment over the course of a couple days, maybe a couple weeks, and then some patients stayed for years. And again, this is um, a piece in our collection, a nurse's uniform. So again, we're also seeing women getting more and more into the workforce as nurses. Again, like I said, we would see that even more during the Second World War, but it did start a little bit in the First World War. So as I mentioned, Maryland was very much prepared um, just in case any German U-boats landed in this area along the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, this is another form of a propaganda poster. So again, I'm just gonna have you take a look, take it all in. And again, since this is a propaganda piece, it's trying to get you to do something. So in the chat, tell me, what is this poster trying to get us to do? Again, yes, nice job. It's getting us to buy Liberty Bonds. And it's saying beat back the Hun. And Hun is a derogatory term, especially for 2021. It's referring to Germans. So this is a derogatory term uh, referring to Germans. So now let's take a look at this artwork. What stands out to you? Yeah, I see a lot of people are, are pointing out 
This guy here in the background. Oh, yes, yeah, someone notices his hands look like they're covered in blood. Yeah, he has a sword. This is actually like a bayonet that is also dripping with blood. Yeah, it's like he's looking over some rubble here. He's looking at the ocean. Oh, and finally someone's pointed out his eyes are like bright green. They almost look like they're glowing. So who do we think uh, this person or this depiction is representing? Yeah, nice job. Yeah, this is representing the Germans. So this is uh, this poster is saying, you know, beat back the Germans, buy these liberty bonds. Oh, and someone pointed out, yeah, this depiction looks very scary. So again, this is playing on those emotions. So the last poster we looked at was kind of playing on like, oh, that patriotism. This is supposed to play on fear. It's to make people fearful of uh, people who are German. And just to try and, you know, keep them away. He's looking over what we can imagine is maybe the Atlantic Ocean, looking over like, oh, we might come to the United States and do something terrible. Again, this is playing on the fear at that time. So this, this is another form of propaganda. So would you consider this a positive form of propaganda? Is it negative? Somewhere in between? Tell me in the chat. Yeah, I see a lot of negatives coming through. Someone said, yeah, it was, it's negative because it's, it's pitting people against one another. So it's telling Americans to be fearful of people who are German. And someone says it's positive because it's trying to get you to buy bonds to like support the United States. All right. Oh yeah, someone else says it is negative because it is playing on those emotions and trying to make people fearful. Good observations. So we're gonna see some of these effects. So in particular here in Maryland. So the German American Marylanders experience, um, Maryland was not as anti-German as some other areas in the United States. However, that's not to say that there wasn't any discrimination that they experienced. So uh, Germans and German Americans joined the army and they raised half a million dollars for Liberty bonds. Um, however, they were also asked to prove their allegiance to the United States. Naturalized Germans were classified as alien enemies. Their homes were searched. They faced suspicion of espionage or being saboteurs. And this is when um, they began to close down like social societies and their newspapers because there were newspapers printed in German, in these uh, German American neighborhoods. And we would, again, we're gonna see this again with Japanese Americans during the second world war where um, people were put into camps uh, because they were also suspected of espionage and being a saboteur, even though there wasn't any evidence to suggest that. So German Americans in the First World War experienced that discrimination as well. So we're going to read a couple of articles here. I know this is really grainy and pixelated. I promise it will look better here in a second. But these are, again, primary sources. Another example of a primary source uh, historians love to use our newspaper articles. So we're going to take a look at German Street No More. I'm going to step out of the way so uh, we can read this nice and clearly. But it says German Street has at last been wiped out. The ordinance changing its name to Redwood Street was signed yesterday by Mayor Preston. It has been before him exactly four weeks awaiting the formation of a plan for a public demonstration in honor of the change, which has been deferred until a later date. The street has been named for Lieutenant George B. Redwood, the first officer from Baltimore to lose his life on the battlefield in France. So tell me, um, why do you think people wanted to change the name German Street? Yeah, because people were becoming more and more fearful of Germans or German Americans. So again, we're seeing that discrimination towards German and German Americans. And then we're seeing that that caused uh, a name change of a street. 
Still to this day, it is Redwood Street. Um, it never changed back to German Street. Another example we're gonna look at here is as to German Street. So this is again, a longer bit of an article. But it says, the deeper we get into the fearful struggle which Germany has forced upon us and the world, the greater is our natural abhorrence of everything which seems even to suggest hateful Prussian spirit. The mounting moral tide of resentment is, in the main, entirely reasonable and credi creditable. It arises from a commendable desire to disassociate ourselves from anything that seems to wear enemy colors to repudiate everything that appears to link us with the representative of a system which has made itself the foe of mankind. All right, that's a lot. Those are a lot of like $100 words in there. So what does uh, this first sentence mean? The deeper we get into the fearful struggle which Germany has forced upon us in the world, the greater is our natural abhorrence of everything which seems even su to suggest hateful Prussian spirit. What does that mean? Take your best guess in the chat. Yeah, again, it's it's calling out saying that people are frightful of Germans, um, Prussia or this Prussian spirit they're referring to that also is uh, referring to Germany and the Germans. And as it goes on, it says it arises from a commendable desire to disassociate ourselves from anything that seems to wear enemy colors, et cetera. So what does that mean? What does it mean to try and disassociate ourselves from anything that seems to wear enemy colors? Yeah, nice job. It's trying to break away. Um, from anything that has anything to do with German or, Germ or Germans or Germany. So we can see this goes on uh, talking about the street name change, talking about uh, why some of the streets in the area are named the way they are and why uh, the support for Redwood uh, being the new name was so um, appealing. So again, it's, it's very patriotic. Also the language in this uh, article I rather like it because it is pretty dramatic. Like it is, it is, it's actually very dramatic saying like, oh, it's, you know, hateful to suggest otherwise. Uh, we must, you know, disassociate. Like the, it's, it's very heightened. The language that's used is um, again, meant to heighten those fears, maybe to heighten um, people's feelings towards particular groups of people. So this news article, would we consider this a piece of propaganda? Tell me yes or no in the chat and why. I'm seeing some yeses. All right, yeah, because it's it, again, it's trying to sway people to why changing a street, the street name is good. It's trying to sway people to why uh, maybe German people could be considered um, suspicious. Yeah, so this is definitely a form of propaganda. It's, again, swaying, swaying your opinions and your ideas. It's trying to, very much it has that bias, trying to get you to think a particular way. And then finally, we're going to read uh, German school closed. So again, I'll step out of the way. This again might be kind of hard to see. I'm gonna try and zoom in a little bit. Oh, too far. So it says things in and around Preston, Caroline County last week and the early part of this week did not look very encouraging to the German population in that section in which there are a number of families, some of them well-to-do farmers. It became rumored that a number of Germans were disloyal and were sowing the seed of German propaganda among the younger element of the Germans. It also became noised that the Boy Scouts of Preston had placed a flag on the German schoolhouse in Preston and that some Ger German had torn it down. This report spread rapidly and the people of the town became incensed and for a time it looked as if the Germans would be forced to close their church and school. This feeling prevailed a, gr a great extent among the members of the Junior Order of American Mechanics 
which have, which have a lodge there with a large membership. And on Monday night, they held a meeting at which there were a number of leading citizens in the town present. At this meeting, it was decided to call a public indig indignation meeting for Thursday night and invite the leading Germans to be present. The meeting was held in Lendrum's Hall with JT Blades, Chop Top presiding. His son, Lieutenant Lawrence Blades of the United States Navy, who is visiting his parents, also was present. People from Caroline and the lower part of Dorchester County came pouring into the town hall. Was, uh, into the town hall was filled, overflowing. Many of those present, leading Germ present being leading Germans. Excuse me. The chief source of trouble was the German school and the church, and that the teacher, the Reverend William Geiger, who was a pastor of the church, who was also the pastor of the church, taught the scholars in the German language and not the English, which the member of the junior order said was not to be allowed. The junior order also demanded that Germans should close their school and erect a flagpole and fly the stars and stripes. A free discussion was had in which some of the more influential Germans took part. All declared that they were loyal to the United States since she had entered the war, but before they were naturally for the fatherland against France and England. They consented to close their school and said they had already erected a flagpole and from its it stop, the stars and stripes were flying. They declared no other flag had ever been raised at the school house and none of the colors of the United, none but the colors of the United States should fly there. Only one instance of German propaganda could be learned. It was said that the children of Mr. and Mrs. John Schmick, who lived in a farm between Preston and Bethlehem, were home and from one of the front windows hoisted an American flag. This enraged their mother and she immediately tore it down and lectured the children telling them that they were German and they must not raise any other flag than the German flag on her house. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack here. So this article is coming out of Preston, Maryland. This is a group of people getting together discussing what is going on at the schoolhouse. Is German being taught? Or, uh, is the German flag being flown? And why, why do we think that would maybe be considered a problem for World War or during this era, during World War I? Why do you think people would have or take issue with schools uh, teaching German or flying the German flag? Yeah, again, it, it's playing on that fearfulness of people of German descent. And uh, if they know the language, maybe that would lead to them liking Germany more than the United States. So there's that concern for like an allegiance to the US. And speaking of allegiance, we pledge our allegiance to the flag. Um, and so they are concerned that people will feel more strongly towards the German flag in Germany than the United States. And we're seeing that this came to a head at like a town meeting. I also think it's really interesting that the Germans and German Americans who were present all declared that they were loyal to the United States and they had to do this um, again, very public it, publicly. It wasn't just assumed. So we're seeing the way people are being discriminated against and treated. Uh, this is also a time where we start seeing less and less German being taught in schools. Again, more so in World War II than in World War I, but um, German was taken out of schools for many, many years because people were concerned that if you learn German, you might be suspected of siding with Germany during these uh, very tumultuous times. So I know today uh, there are schools that offer German now, but uh, it was much more prevalent as like a second language that you could take prior to World War I and World War II. So we are seeing, um, again, different forms of propaganda in uh, newspaper articles, in propaganda posters. And this is all um, very timely to talk about because we are also about to celebrate Veterans Day in uh, two days on November 11th. So we're going to round out with our final question here is, why do we celebrate Veterans Day? So going from talking about, you know, Germans and German Americans in the home front, why do we celebrate Veterans Day? Yeah, to, to celebrate veterans. Um, nice job. Yeah, it's to honor the veterans who have currently served and to those who, uh, have served in the past. So it honors all veterans. It's not quite like Memorial Day that honors the veterans that have passed. Um, and we remember them, but it, it honors 
everybody who has served in the military. And it originated as Armistice Day on November 11th, 1919, uh, because that was the first anniversary of the ending of World War I. There was supposed to be a one there. I, forgive me, that is a typo. Um, but World War I ended on November 11th, 1918 at 11, 11 a.m. So that's why we have Veterans Day today. So with that, um, we're running a little low on time. So I would love to um, open it up to any questions and I'll make sure to pop an image up here so we all can take uh, a selfie with it. All right, thanks so much, Ashley. And I'm actually gonna say not necessarily a typo, right? At the time, World War I was the only world war because there hadn't been a two yet. That and so, um, so yeah, World War was uh, was just what it was. Like uh, it was Ashley also mentioned- known as the Great War because people thought like, this is it, this is the Great War. This is the biggest it's ever gonna be. And then little did we know the second world, one, world war was coming around the corner. Uh, that's that's a great point. So lots of name changes. Actually, there are a couple questions about that. So uh, at this point, everybody, keep your questions coming in, and we'll uh, we'll ask Ashley uh, at least a handful of those here in, uh, in just a minute. Um, all the way back to the idea of disseminating information. Social media is a form of of uh, communication, and maybe it could be used for propaganda. Although that's not what we're suggesting right now. Uh, we do want everybody to get an opportunity to lean into the screen, take a selfie with some propaganda here to be able to to show your social networks what you spent today learning. So we're gonna go full screen on the, uh, the, the, you know, buy us bonds. Um, we'll have some questions about that here, Let everybody take that picture while you're doing that. I'll just keep narrating. Make sure you guys know what to do. If you tag varsity tutors, um, and the Maryland center, what we'll the official handles, uh, up on a slide here at the end, uh, you'll be entered to win a spot in a varsity tutors after school club to learn kind of anything you want to learn, uh, after school this year. So hopefully everybody's got some great pictures. We look forward to seeing those up on Instagram with those hashtags, MD history, I'm sorry, the ask, not the hashtags, MD history and uh, at Bar City Tutors. And now time to get to uh, a few of your questions. One, I think kind of um, leading right to what we've got here on the screen. Let me actually get back on the screen here with you guys. Um, is uh, we talked a lot about war bonds and liberty bonds. And so there's some questions about, can you explain what those are? Were they, were they the same thing, war bonds and liberty bonds? Um, just a lot of questions wanting to know more about those bonds. Yeah, so these bonds are something that you could invest in, and then that money um, would eventually go to troops. War bonds and liberty bonds, I get a little confused on which is which, but they did um, very similar things where money would be sent over to troops uh, for, oh gosh, uniforms, ammunition, um, for any technology that they may be needed. So technology like tanks and uh, we're also seeing a, a time here where technology changed and changed very quickly. Again, we would see that also again with World War II. So these bonds um, and loans, uh, the loans you would get your money back uh, eventually, but that money went towards supporting the war. Hopefully that makes sense. It's a very quick overview. <laughs> Oh, perfect. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, you know, you know, uh, lending them the government money specifically mm -hmm. to be able to, uh, to pay for the war. So, um, thank you for that. And then speaking of war bonds and, and the propaganda posters here, um, you also showed kind of that big increase in, uh, in, in the amount of bonds sold once these started, do you have any information about, um, do we know, you know, when the, 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 the two different ads that we saw, and I'm sure there were probably others in there, you know, when those came out and really what people wanted to know about is, do we know which one was more effective, which of these can campaigns, the pro-patriotism or, or sort of the uh, anti-enemy ones? That's, that's a good question. I don't know particularly like exactly when these posters came out. Again, we can say between 1917 and 1918, but I don't know those exact dates. And I'm actually going to turn it over to you all. What do you think would be most effective? Would it be this more positive approach to propaganda? Would it be the more negative approach to propaganda that we looked at? What do you think would be most effective and why? I'm seeing some positives, some negatives. Oh, interesting. Someone said negative because again, like that, that fear base is going to like really drive people versus maybe this idea of patriotism driving people. Oh, but someone then says positive because it is leaning into patriotism and that maybe appealed to people over a hundred years ago. Yeah, so it's, it's hard to say what is most effective. Um, 
it might also be kind of subjective too. And whatever you feel more strongly towards, that's maybe what you're going to lean towards more. So it's hard to tell which is more effective, um, but it all depends on the person. Awesome. And maybe that's a good explanation for why they needed both was to, to try both. And maybe, you know, there's something in the overlap of the two that, you know, seeing a little bit of fear and then a little bit of pride mixes together, sort of like. Um, Again, sometimes but, we see it too with um, like political ads today, like I said, saying, this is why you should vote for me. I've done all these great things or don't vote for this person because we don't like the things that they did. Again, it's playing on the like positives and negatives. So it's, it's the same stuff, just in a different format, in different era. Excellent. And actually on that um, couple of, of questions really around sort of uh, varieties of propaganda, were there, were there more varieties than this? I think we saw pro-patriotism and, and anti-enemy um, and, uh, and did the, you know, as, as World War II came about and, and other wars, Vietnam and, and you know, so on, um, did these propaganda campaigns kind of continue in, in similar forms or was this more localized to, you know, that era in time? Um, yeah, we, you'd see even more propaganda posters during World War II. Um, one of the more, most famous ones, like we, we think about like the Uncle Sam Wants You poster. We think about uh, the like Grow a Victory Garden poster. Those were pretty popular to encourage people to grow their own food at home. So more of that um, food could go over to troops overseas. Uh, so this posters were pretty effective um, back in the day. And I mean, again, sometimes we even see it today um, on billboards. Maybe politicians will do billboards. Maybe people who want to sway your ideas. Well, you can buy out a billboard. Like uh, if you have the if you have the funds, you can do that and you can spread whatever message you'd like. So um, we see it in different forms, but that's that's the closest comparison to like the posters we see today. We still see similar ideas here. And now just, you know, so many more new media, right? This was pre-television, um, you know, kind of early radio. So, it, uh, you know, we see the posters now oh, yeah. are, uh, localized, but um, there are all kinds of different ways to, uh, to reach there, out. There would be radio ads too. Um, unfortunately, that we don't have any audio of that in our um, program here. But I think if you look up the Library of Congress, they have radio ads on um like World War One and World War II propaganda saying, buy such and such, support the troops, or do such and such and support the troops. So again, uh, it came in different forms, this, this type of propaganda. But at our, our museum, we have these posters. This is the cool part of like digital education as well as I can digitize this poster and then show it to all of you. And um, it keeps the poster nice and preserved. Uh, and we're not taking it out every time um, I'd like to show it. I can have it in a digital copy and show it a hundred times over and no damage is being done to the original. But we like to show these because these do come from our collection. But there's a ton more out there. If this is something that interests you, uh, go, go look into the National Archives and the Library of Congress because there are so much more, as well as our um, museum's collection as well. Uh, that is mdhistory.org. You can see more of the posters that we have uh, here at the Maryland Center for History and Culture. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for sharing part of your collection with us. Um, I think that'll count more as advertising than propaganda, right? You're just talking about what's great about the Maryland Center for History and Culture. So everybody, um, please, uh, please go check it out. If it turns out, I'm going to check the uh, the wallet and see if I've got the funds for a billboard. I'll encourage everyone to uh, to go visit as well. With that, we'll, uh, I'm not sure if this is advertising or propaganda either. We're going to show everyone the uh, instructions to uh, to be able to enter that Instagram contest here. Before I do that, uh, Ashley, just want to say a huge thank, uh, thank you to all of you at uh, the Maryland Center for, uh, for putting on this program for us and for all kinds of great programming you've been doing with us throughout the year. So huge thanks to uh, to Ashley. Thanks to all of you for uh, some amazing questions. And the chat was really hopping today with all kinds of commentary great. and all those things. So really appreciate that. And we'll see everybody back here soon. Thank you all so much.